Well, thank you, and thank you for the invitation to um, contribute to today's discussion. Uh, it's a pleasure to follow on from my old friend, Kim Beasley, and um, I know he would have loved to be here, uh, and he's probably particularly uncomfortable with the fact that I'll be answering questions on his behalf. Um, it's, um, you know, some things never change. As I walked into this room, I saw many familiar faces, um, people that um, uh, supported me during my years as, uh, as minister, and I'm pleased to see that they're still uh, so engaged. Um, some, like uh, Chris Barry, are looking younger. Some, like Mike Pizzullo, are looking older. Mick Roach is looking the same. Uh, Paul Dibb seems to be forever. Got a good, good run again in uh, Kim Beasley's presentation today. Uh, and even um, my young staffer, Sean Costello, who addressed the conference earlier in the day, or maybe it was the Associated Conference, uh, on behalf of um, Defence Industry, in which he said um, governments need to have an 80-year vision and when I saw his speech, I sent him a message back reminding him that the political term was three years. So there still seems to be a little disconnect between what industry would like and what the political realities are. Um, I've been asked to, um, to follow on with the period of the, of the Howard government. Uh, and um, so uh, I'm talking about 1996 to 2007, uh, which um, includes my period as Defence Minister, which was four years from 2002 to 2006, uh, but reminds me that um, over that period we in fact had, um, had five Defence Ministers, probably uh, a bit more than is desirable in 11 years, Ian McLaughlin, John Moore, Peter Reith, myself and then uh, Brendan Nelson, and I'm reminded, although I didn't need it, that the Chiefs of Navy um, during my time were David Shackleton, Chris Ritchie and Russ Shoulders. Before that it was Rod Taylor and Donald Chalmers. So Kim Beasley talked a lot about um, uh, the strategic guidance and and the basis, the reasons for which the government of the day through its white papers uh, determined that, um, that guidance. Um, during my time, we didn't, um, we didn't write another white paper. And this was actually despite some within defence that um, argued that we should do so. I guess if you have a section in defence whose job it is to write white papers, they like to be tasked to write white papers. But I was of the view that, um, that white papers are not something that you do often. In fact, you only do it, you could legitimately do it with a, a change of government, but otherwise uh, you only do it if you believe that the strategic guidance under which you've been operating uh, is out of, um, out of date. Uh, I was um, operating under a white paper that was put down in, in, 2000, in the year two, uh, 2000. Um, and so we'd had a few years after we got into government to think about what we were, we were wanting to say and, um, and we completed that white paper process, which we took very, very seriously with um, uh, long and complex periods of um, public consultation and the like. Uh, and I found that um, in looking at that white paper, although we faced a range of new challenges, some of which have been mentioned, the issues of, um, of terrorism, the regional stabilisation challenges in the like, uh, in fact, the guidance within the paper uh, and WMD, the guidance had foreshadowed that risk and therefore had incorporated the need to be uh, ready to meet that challenge if it in, in, in fact was presented. Uh, and one of the things that I found interesting about um, 
Kim Beasley's presentation today was that although his, uh, his guidance, his white papers, were heavily premised on the concept of defence of Australia uh, and self-reliance, and he reminded us that in fact, in part, that went back to political attitudes within the Labor Party following uh, the end of the Vietnam War, uh, he found that when the threats that he had to address, the tasks that he had to meet, were not those that were anticipated, primarily anticipated within the guidance, he nevertheless had the capability within the, within the force to, uh, to meet those, um, those challenges. But it is nevertheless um, uh, interesting to see the differences in emphasis, uh, and I'll only say it's in emphasis, but um, what we used to tease Kim on the, the principle, uh, we, we described his policy as the policy of concentric circles. Um, you know, you, 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 you have a more intense capability the closer you get to the Australian mainland, uh, and you have these circles that move out. We tended to see the globe a little differently and suspected that the tasks that uh, we might be engaged in could well be further afield, uh, which in fact turned out to be the, um, the case. We, we believe there was, perhaps more than Kim did, a greater likelihood of being requested to be part of, an, of expeditionary forces and maybe on our side of politics we had, were more, more inclined to be ready to join those expeditionary um, requirements. But um, as he said in his presentation today, uh, he was uh, nevertheless faced with the issue of the first Gulf War uh, and his, um, his government decided to contribute uh, naval capabilities on, uh, on Australia's behalf. And when I look at um, our doctrine, in the 2000 white paper, uh, I have to concede that um, we, were, we were given four different levels of uh, potential threat stroke uh, task. Uh, and I think the expeditionary uh, potential was still listed as, um, as number four. But the point that um, I'm really wanting to make is that um, he found that uh, although things didn't work out exactly as he anticipated, that he found there was sufficient flexibility in Australia's naval capabilities to meet uh, the unexpected as well as the expected. Uh, and although we had put the, the, the likelihood of involvement in operations against um, terrorists and to constrain weapons of mass destruction, uh, at the like as a lower likelihood, we nevertheless found that, uh, that we had the capability within Australia's Navy to meet um, all, of those, all of those contingencies. Uh, and I guess that's the, um, one of the principal um, lessons that came from, from, from my experience. Uh, and, uh, and when we talk about um, capability requirements, uh, where Australia is, is never going to have a large navy, uh, we are more likely than not to, be, to, be, to face a whole range of different contingencies uh, and we need to build as much flexibility as, uh, as possible uh, into our force structure because the unexpected is just as likely to be before us as the, um, as the expected. So, um, Many of Kim's uh, decisions, and some uh, of which he mentioned today, I inherited, which I guess is the second point that I really wanted to make, and that is that um, uh, you know, ministers change, defence chiefs change, but, um, but there is uh, nevertheless um, a, you know, a capability that's got to, that's got to continue not, uh, notwithstanding, so I inherited a certain continuity, I guess, what I inherited was the two ocean basing uh, decision. Uh, I inherited the Collins class submarines, although at that time um, Rankin had not been had not been commissioned. 
Uh, I inherited the, um, the Adelaide class frigates. Um, the upgrade decision I got, from, I got from a colleague, but I think the decision to decommission two was in my time. Uh, the Anzac class um, frigates were in the process of being, uh, of being delivered. Uh, I made the decision on the air warfare destroyers and also on the new Armadale patrol boats. Um, I remember the um, I remember the debate about should they be aluminium? Is that a risk? Um, and there were the three contenders bidding: one steel, one aluminium, and one I called it plastic, but uh, a composite. And I can remember being up in uh, Newcastle, and it must have been was it four jacks, but anyway, one of those in Newcastle were wanting to demonstrate to me the, the quality of the composite and they were dropping sharp spikes onto this composite material to convince me that this was the, this was the way to go with a new class of, um, class of patrol boats. I must say in passing, um, uh, we never envisaged that the Armadale class would have to work as hard as they, as they have and you know, I um, I commend those who've had to had to serve serve on them in circumstances beyond that which we anticipated. Uh, the the uh, the new Canberra class uh, amphibious ships was part of the was within our white paper, but I worked on that um, and that project. And although I didn't make the ultimate choice between the French and the Spanish designs. Um, looking at both the French ship and visiting the Spanish shipyard and talking to them about their options was, was uh, an informative experience for me. Um, uh, a capability that I am very pleased that Australia is, uh, is getting because you know, with what I've just said about flexibility, I think those ships will give our Navy great, uh, great capacity and great flexibility. Uh, and uh, I, of course, had the, both um, uh, the Canimbla and the Manura, and in my time, they did a great, um, great job. I inherited from a colleague the Hewan class mine hunters. Um, I was responsible for the purchase of a fleet oiler. In relation to the fleet arm, I inherited the Seahawks and Sea Kings, and I inherited the decision to purchase and refurbish the sea sprites. Um, I'm probably one of the few people in this room that's actually flown in a refurbished sea sprite. Uh, the only problem was that after we'd completed the flight and my pilots returned to headquarters, a question arose about whether the aircraft was certified for the flight. But nevertheless, uh, we got, uh, we got we got back. So um, I learned a lot from that project. And uh, I have to say that um, uh, really the major challenges I, I had in the portfolio were challenges relating to the, um, uh, the refurbishment of, um, of equipment. Uh, and I think it uh, it pays to be realistic up front. You know, one of the good things about defence, but also one of the things that needs to be watched carefully is when you say to the military, "Can this be done?" The answer is always yes, sir. But sometimes it's probably not the, the best answer to uh, to receive. And I hope that we've learnt some uh, uh, some lessons from uh, from that. But I have to say. Uh, in relation to you know, the, the subject that's brought up so often, and that is the, um, uh, the Collins class um, uh, submarines, uh, of where I was deeply involved in issues of refurbishment almost before they were operational. Um, uh, when we, and it's not in the brief that was kindly sent to me, but when we sent those boats on operational tasks, they did a superb job. And Kim would like to hear me say this, that uh, 
uh, I think that they've in many ways received a bad, uh, a bad press. And I guess it's relevant, the future is as well, that um, a submarine and are very complex and the challenge of building, maintaining, building, operating and upgrading submarines uh, is a huge and complex uh, task and won't come uh, without, a, without a few tears. So um, with that, I wanted to talk a bit about the operations because um, although you know, we make, we make the decisions to deploy. We have very little to do with um, how successful or otherwise the operations are. Uh, but my period of time as minister and really the whole of the Howard government was one in which the Navy was, um, was very, very busy on so many different, uh, different tasks and uh, did um, did an excellent job. So I thought I'd just, um, I'd just touch on a few because I think it'll remind you and a few who are visitors may maybe not have heard, uh, heard this before, the breadth of the tasks, the operations that the Royal Australian Navy undertook during that period of the, of the Howard government. Uh, my briefing note just separates what is called the routine tasks from the named operational tasks. But even those routine tasks were full of challenge, search from very difficult search and rescue operations, um, work on the national surveillance program, the hydrographic support in support of commercial shipping, the major um, uh, bilateral and multilateral exercises, many challenging tasks within what is described as routine. Uh, but beyond routine, uh, there were a whole range of very important operations that have become uh, part of the, the legacy of the Australian, the Royal Australian Navy, of which its service personnel should be very, very proud. The first was, the, was Operation Damask, which was the ADF's contribution to the economic and military sanctions against Iraq from 1990 to 2001 to conduct compliant boardings, to interdict illegal and uh, smuggling trade. Uh, and and um, they resulted in significant reductions in the, to the extent of goods being smuggled out of Iraq and were a credit to the Navy. The second area is one that many within the Navy probably wished they had never been asked to do, uh, which were the Southern Oceans Fisheries Patrols. Uh, sounds pretty straightforward, but in ships that were really not built for the, the task, in the most inhospitable of waters, they were uh, hugely challenging. So Operation Dirk in 1997, Operation Stanhope also in 1997, Operation T-Bone in 2001, which resulted in the successful appreh apprehension of the South Tumi after a 2,200 nautical pursuit across the Southern Ocean, uh, being joined uh, later on by the Navy of South, South Africa, uh, a huge, um, a huge achievement. Uh, Operation Gemspock, which apprehended the Viasa uh, One, which uh, I remember well. And Operation Celeste, which apprehended the Maya Five. Uh, these, um, one area I do know about is, is Camelar and conservation in the Southern, uh, southern Oceans. Uh, and the operations of the Royal Australian Navy really changed the game. It was after the, the marauders realised that there was a force that was going to be dispatched that would, that would chase them from one side of the ocean to the other until they were caught. Before that, they basically were, were free to do as they pleased. After that, the whole game changed. Uh, and that area is, is largely free of what I refer to as the, as the pirates now. 
and it wouldn't be so without the, the efforts of the Royal Australian Navy. Uh, and I remember, I remember, I'm not sure which one of the operations it was, but um, in one instance, uh, a boarding craft had been sent to apprehend the illegal boat and overturned, and I think two men of our Navy were in the water, and the second boarding uh, boat was sent, and it overturned, so there were four in the water, and there was one helicopter on the ship, and the one helicopter was dispatched to rescue the four men and succeeded in doing so. But you don't last long in the Southern Ocean. And with the one ship in terrible conditions, uh, it just illustrated to me as minister, and for some reason or other, I was doing a conference in Sydney, and, and the Navy kindly were giving me up-to-the-minute reports of how these men were faring in the, in the water. But it was one of those occasions as minister that you have this sudden uh, feeling, you know, was it the right decision to send uh, forces into that, uh, to that environment? And I know that the officers and men weren't all that keen to go down there, but I do remember um, coming upon one of those ships in the Gulf one day, uh, and the same men who weren't so keen to go down there were so proud when they showed me the photos of the apprehension of this ship after, after uh, such a challenging, uh, challenging mission. Uh, they were really chuffed with what they had achieved, and so, and so they should be. Then uh, 19, uh, 1997 to 2006, Operation Cranberry, Australia's fisheries patrols in northern Australia, uh, which were also tricky in many ways, politically tricky. And then from 97 to 98 um, was the assistance to Bougainville, Operation Bell EC, uh, together with New Zealand, assistance to the Australian New Zealand Truce Monitoring Group in, in Bougainville, and then Operation Bell EC 2, 1998 to 2001, uh, to provide further support. Uh, that the, that uh, mission was successful in the end. It was a nasty environment, and the backup of the Royal Australian Navy was uh, was critically important, uh, and we were most appreciative of them being uh, being there and providing that support. 1998 Operation Avarian Linnet, supporting the AFPs and agencies and drug enforcement operations of New South Wales. There were several operations of that type. And then we moved to the East Timor suite of operations, 1997, Operation Spitfire, following the surge of violence in East Timor after the referendum on independence, followed by Operation Warden and Operation Stabilised, 1999 to 2000, which was the peace enforcement operation in East Timor, uh, Interfet. Uh, and I can tell you that the, I wasn't minister, but that day in the cabinet when we made the decision to intervene in East Timor was one of the toughest days that, um, that we had. Uh, and we were lucky to have the force that, um, that we did that supported us in that uh, difficult political decision. 2000 to 2001, Operation Tanager, which was, um, as you, you Tayet assumed control of Interfet. And then, um, and then again in 2006, by which time I was already at the uh, UN when violence flared again East in East Timor, the Royal Australian Navy went there, uh, there again. The next suite of operations related to uh, the Solomon Islands. Uh, Solomon Islands uh, first Operation Plumbok in 2000, following the abduction of the then Prime Minister in the Solomons. 2000, Operation Dorsal in support of the peace negotiation process. And 2003 to 2004, Operation Anode in support of, of, of Ramsey. And Ramsey was a, was a first for Australia. We'd, we, we'd never had a, um, a regional stabilisation mission of that, that type. Uh, and the important role of the, um, the Royal Australian Navy 
and the role of the Royal Australian Navy in giving us the confidence to be able to lead that, uh, that mission uh, first was very, very important to us. Then, of course, uh, we had the operations in the Persian Gulf in support of the US-led international coalition against terrorism, Operation Slipper, started in 2001 uh, to 2000, um, still continuing, as I understand it. In fact, I'm told that uh, it is now in its 31st rotation. Nobody would have, um, would have ever, ever guessed. Then uh, the operation to detect and, uh, and deny access to unorthodox boat arrivals, the operations Relics 1 and Relics 2, was one of the most difficult experiences for the Royal Australian Navy off the north of Australia. And um, we all went through some very difficult uh, times in relation to it, but those on the front line that had to make some very tough decisions uh, did a wonderful job in those uh, circumstances and we were hugely appreciative. Um, I'm starting to feel tired for the Navy, I have to say. And that's before we get to the operations in Iraq. 2003, Operation Bastille, support of the build-up. 2003, Operation Faulkner, uh, the military operation. 2003 to 2009, Operation Catalyst in stabilisation and rehabilitation efforts. We had in 2004 to 5 Operation Sumatra uh, to uh, assist um, after the tsunami. Uh, uh, and um, uh, again, I can remember um, Fairwell, and I think it was uh, Canimbla again out of Darwin, and thinking, thank goodness we had that capacity at that time. It was one of the, and I can remember being told on the wharves in Darwin that there was further equipment that they would have liked to take, but the ship wasn't big enough. And I thought, well, the next ships we get will be bigger. Uh, even though some people don't argue for bigger ships, I think bigger ships give you more, more flexibility. Operation Quick State in Fiji in 2006. So um, a hugely uh, busy period of time on a great range of different types of operations. Uh, and um, I, can, I can say that government was so appreciative of the professionalism and the judgment that Navy played uh, in, them, in them all. I thought I'd just mention it before I sit down, just a few of the personal highlights. I've, I've already mentioned the Southern Ocean and the fact that it really transformed the Southern Ocean in terms of um, the management of marine resources and conservation. Uh, one of my most meaningful experiences was on the Anzacs shortly after she had um, fired in anger in the, in the Gulf. Uh, I had the privilege at times to be at Gallipoli on Anzac Day and um, at, at Trabuk in Libya on Anzac Day, but to be on an operational Australian warship on Anzac Day was something that um, I'll, be, I'll never forget. Uh, some interesting experiences in the, in the Gulf also. I, as some of you will know that the operational uh, command of that force, the coalition force, rotated uh, and that Australians on occasions took command. And I was coincidentally on Australian warship when an incident occurred. The force was being commanded by an Australian officer on an American ship and it was one of those small um, Iranian boats that got too close and nobody was quite sure what the game was going, going to be and it called for a response. And to hear over the radio the Australian officer calling in the American warship to intervene was something that I won't, I won't forget. I thought to myself, I wonder what they'd say about that in the US Congress, but nevertheless, nevertheless I think it, it illustrates the uh, the confidence that uh, existed within the alliance and within the forces that made up those, um, uh, those coalitions. Uh, the experience of the tsunami reminds me to do up my tie in Arche um, was something um, I'll never forget. And one, one particular aspect, immediately, of course, it was just after Christmas, and I remember uh, Peter Cosgrove was Chief of the Defence Force and, and we talked about the force, the, the capability we could send to help. 
Uh, we wanted to send air, uh, you know, materials by air, uh, and the issue was where the aircraft could land, and the thought of Australian military aircraft landing in Arche was a, was a little beyond comprehension at the time. But I rang the Indonesian Defence Minister, and Cosgrove rang the Chief of the Indonesian Defence Force, and we both said the most useful place for us to land these resources would be in Arche, and both, without hesitation, said, um, go to it. And in some ways, Australia's relationship with Indonesia changed from that, um, from that day. Um, and um, uh, it's very, it's, it's, it's a little personal, I have to say, but um, I remember visiting Ramsey in the Solomon Islands and the, I think it was one of our mine hunters we had there, took me out to lay a wreath over uh, the ship my father served on in the Second World War, the Canberra, uh, that was sunk um, uh, at that spot. And he, um, he survived. In fact, he was one of the few men that had boots on and his task was to get his colleagues, as many as he could, off the, um, off the ship. But um, it reminded me of the importance of Canberra in the history of the Royal Australian Navy. And I was, of course, present at then at the uh, decommissioning of the FFG Canberra, which was a, a sad day. And I'm pleased that the first of our new large uh, amphibious support ships is going to be called the Canberra, not that I had anything to do with choosing, choosing the name. Um, I'll finish. Um, I enjoyed going down in Rankin. Fortunately, it was a, Rankin also came, came up. Good experience for the Defence Minister to actually go down uh, in a submarine. Uh, and the only time um, that, uh, that uh, I was pleased that something didn't work in the Navy, uh, I was on a ship in the Gulf, and um, they decided this was a ship that was um, uh, interdicting smuggling operations. And there was a large tanker that was to be boarded and inspected. And, they, uh, and I could see it on the horizon, huge ship. And they said, Minister, we're going to take you across to the ship and you can go on board and see what we do. And I said, how am I going to get on board? And they said, they'll put down a rope ladder. Anyway, fortunately, the boarding vessel broke down and the, and the trip across to the tanker had to be missed. Uh, how pleased I was that the Navy on that occasion broke, broke down. So thank you for the opportunity to, um, to compliment what um, Kim said from Labor's period to give you some of my uh, experiences uh, and reflections on the period of the Howard government.